saying all that, we will begin our lesson today. And we will open our lesson in the book of 1 John in the New Testament. However, you know, I always like to do a um, overview of what we concluded the past week or so. And we finished, we concluded the book of 2 Peter on last week. And just to give you some brief information on Peter for those who may not have been able to, 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 to join us. We talked about 2 Peter and the purpose of 2 Peter. And Peter, Peter's purpose for writing his book was to warn against the false teachers and false prophets, to encourage, to grow, for encouragement for us to grow in our faith and to know more about the Savior, Jesus the Christ, that we profess as our personal Savior. Peter also gave us guidance for growing Christians. And you know, since we've come off the milk, we are continuing to grow daily. And Peter also gave us the dangers and the warnings to us growing Christians because we know the more and more we walk closer to God, the more and more we are, are, are taking this journey called faith, we know that there are going to be some dangers and some warnings. And Peter also helped to remind us that there is hope for us that are growing in Christ, for the growing Christian, because during his time, you know, we recall of the persecutions and everything that was going on during Peter's day. And so uh, um, what we're looking at today and what Peter warned against was with the false teachers. And so it brought me to our book of First John and to do an overview on uh, who John is, who John was, to give us an overview about the purpose of John's writings, some things that we need to remember, and we probably already know, but we're going to go back to the basics. And I was learning that through studying the book of uh, 1 John, that he goes back to the basic basics to remind people where they came from, those things we learned early on in our faith, and we must stay true and dear to them as we grow. Because sometimes as we grow, sometimes we tend to forget from whence we came. Sometimes we tend to think that if we have grown to another level, we don't need to remember the ABCs, the one, two, threes. And even though our faith walk encourages us to grow more and encourages us to grow more, we know that you have to keep those basics in mind because Think about those that, just think about those. I wrote a couple of examples down and those that may have served in the military. You remember you went through basic training and that basic training helped those to learn some core fundamentals of survival, of how to live in the time of trouble, in the live, how to live when you're going to war, when you're facing obstacles. So that was the first inkling that came to mind when I was thinking about basic training. I also thought about those, you know how you first learn how to ride a bicycle? Some of us may have had the training wheels and the training wheels were the basics to keeping the bike steady until we learn how to do it, amen? And so if you could just think of some other areas in your life where you have learned basic things to help you, uh, uh, hey, for us that know that, that learn how to cook, you know, how to boil water. <laughs> Those are just some of the basics. You have to learn how to boil water before you can learn how to put something over in that water. And so I wanted to just open our minds to receive and remember that basics are very fundamental. Basics still need to be applied, but basics or the stepping stone to help us to go to the next level. But we should never forget our basics. Amen? And so, trying to put together our lesson for today, I want us to think about, I want us to think about John, 1 John. And this is also the same John that we read about during the, in the Synoptic Gospels. John is the same disciple who is now an apostle. John has grown. Remember, Peter also was one of the original disciples. But now we just finished first and second Peter. Peter has grown to a new level to, to, to be able to be an eyewitness. 
And so as I was reading John, 1 John, it brought me back to those things that we already know about John. John walked and talked with Jesus, the same as Peter did. John saw Jesus heal, heard him teach, and watched him die. Met him when met him as an arisen savior, and then saw him too, saw him when he ascended back into heaven. So that means that first John, that John, the apostle John, is an eyewitness, same as Peter. He didn't have to go back and, 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 and listen to anybody to find out who Jesus was because he knew firsthand. He didn't have to make up anything. He didn't have to get stories from others to tell the world about Jesus and the believers during his time. John knew that Jesus was God. John knew that Jesus was the word. John had lived with Jesus and seen him work, seen him work the miracles and the signs. John enjoyed fellowshipping. He enjoyed fellowshipping with the father and the son all the days of his life. John was referred to as an elder statesman in the church. And an elder states as an elder and as a statesman, I looked up those two words because you're going to see more and more and hear more and more as we go through the book of first John. An elder, if we recall, we want to know what an elder is. An elder is an older person, especially one with a respected position in society. You should listen and, and listen to the advice of your elders. And isn't this what we teach our children, what we teach our grandchildren? To listen to your elders, to take their advice and their wisdom, even though they don't want to, you still put it out there. Because if you don't, what would they have to fall back on? What will they have as a foundation? The same for us as in Christ. As I continue to look up the other words relating to John being an elder statesman, I looked up the word statesman, but it can also apply to a woman a stateswoman, a statesperson. And it says a person who is experienced in the art of government or versed in the administration of government affairs. A person who exhibits great wisdom and ability in, a, in directing the affairs of a government or dealing with important public issues. And wasn't John dealing with public issues? He was dealing with the church. He was dealing with the public in terms of the Christians and the believers being persecuted. And so he was very important in dealing with public issues, especially in the church. And so in these five chapters of John, a book of first John, he will give eyewitness accounts based on his credentials and not what somebody told him. We also have to remember that John, the beloved John, is who Jesus asked to look after his mother. And don't you know, if you ask somebody to look after your mother, you got to really think pretty highly of them. Just think about the people in your lives, the people that you are surrounded with. For those who still have their mothers with them, but even those who have gone on, think about those people in your lives that if you had to have someone to watch over your mother, who would it be? So John was the person, the disciple that Jesus asked during Jesus' day to take care, to look after his mother before he died. Because he knew what was coming, he knew what was coming forth. We also have to remember when we were talking in second, first and second Peter, that Peter, when he wrote second Peter, he was on death row. And we have to remember, hmm, John now, knowing his fate is going to be coming to an end soon. This is not his final writing because we're going to go into the second Second John as well, but we're going to go to the book of Revelation that John was given credit as writing. But however, we know that John's demise is coming. But in the meantime, John is going to present God in this book of First John. The apostle John is going to present God and Jesus as light, love, and life. John and 1 John are similar in writings because of John's assurance of Jesus' divinity. When John wrote the book of John, the Synoptic Gospel, John, he didn't write it 
the same order or the same way that the other writers wrote the Synoptic Gospels, which are your Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John sometimes was included in that because they all wrote about Jesus's life, his death, things that he did. But John talked about Jesus being God. And this is what he's doing again in this book of 1 John. But now John is more experienced. John is a perfect eyewitness. Like Peter, he was with Jesus. He walked with him. He talked with him. And so John wrote this book. The apostle John wrote this book to clear up any misconceptions or dispel any doubts and to build assurance by presenting a clear picture of who Christ is. Jesus was and is God in the flesh and God in focus. John is making sure that the people know that Jesus is God. He's seen him. He heard him. He even touched him. And so he is the one that authored this letter. And who better than John to write this letter? Who better than John to talk about the supreme being of God? That Jesus is God? Ooh. So I want to kind of move a little forward because we're going to read uh, chapter one today. And also just to bring out some more points in before we even began our walk in the book of first John. John had written this during a when there was a decline in Christian commitment. And, you know, we see a lot of that these days as well, because many believers were, were conforming to the world and the world standards. They were failing to stand up for Christ and they started compromising their faith. We can say that's true because does anybody believe that's happening today still in 2020? A lot of people are walking away because they want to know where is God? They want to know where is this God that I serve or where is this God you supposed to serve? But we have to remember, as we talked about last week, God is a God of time and not of timing. One day is like a thousand years in God's sight. So we have to remember the patience that Peter even talked about before we closed out on last week. But John wrote this with authority, this book to give believers assurance and confidence in God and in our faith. John had a special relationship with Jesus. John was older and perhaps the only surviving apostle still living at this time. Remember, Peter met his demise. The Romans hung Peter upside down. Peter died. Shortly after, shortly after writing those books. But I want to still remember, I want us to remember that John was a good man. He was referred to as the beloved. And John was known also as the apostle of love. So if you don't remember anything else about John, remember, he is the apostle known as the apostle of love. John is going to give us some brief statements. John is going to be comparing Light and night and day, love and hate, good and evil. He's going to be comparing God and Satan. He's going to be talking about life and death. Whew. John is going to be giving us emphasis. He's going to emphasize the basic of our faith so that he, we can be confident in our faith because when we lack confidence, these truths bring us back to what we know, best, back, bring us back to basics, bring us back to certainty. When we receive or hear truth on a higher level, this positions us for growth. Can I get a witness? When you go to that next level, that's growth for us. So John is reminding us. John is reminding us when we receive or hear the truth. So that's why you got to watch out for the false prophets. So you will know who's lying, who's lying on God, who's making up stuff. And these were the people during his day that they were in a group, um, what that they call heresies. And, and, and these people moved away from the true doctrine and start teaching false doctrine. They were teaching the Christians, the new believers, the, the, the new ones, the new babes in Christ. They were teaching them things that weren't even so. Telling them that, oh, it's okay to sin. You, you're going to die anyway. Uh, there's no eternity. Just, just go ahead and live like you want. Do what you want. We don't, we don't, when we, when you accepted your, uh, Christ as your personal savior, then, uh, 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 you can't sin anymore. You, you, you don't sin anymore. So they was telling lies. 
They were telling all these lies and people were believing them and they started backsliding. They started living lives just like the world. And we can say that for us today. It is all, it's also going to remind us that uh, 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 that while we are, are, are reading this book, the church was still determined. The church was still trying to determine what made someone a true child of God. And does it ever cross your mind at any time? What makes me a true child of God outside of us confessing our faith? Is it the way that we should live or want to strive to live? Or is it us comparing our religion to other religions and seeing how, and you know, there are some cults out there now, those things that man try to control or control people through false religion and false doctrine because they don't know the true doctrine. But it also helps us to understand that true children of God are, this book was written for us to live in the light and the love of one another and to love each other. John being the apostle of love. And so we're going to see where John is going to confront. He's going to confront those false teachers. He's going to call them out and talk about those lies that they are telling. Some of those things I just told us about. John is going to call them out on how they are telling the people, oh, you can sin. Uh, uh, I mean, you can't sin because you're saved. That you, you don't sin since you're saved. You don't have to worry about not sinning. But we can't believe that because whew, it's going to get us even more trouble doing the judgment. <laughs> when we know better, we tend to do better. So if you've been brought up and taught the doctrine of Christ and knowing that God is love, Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. If somebody's telling us something different than what we believe and what we know that we know that we know, whew, we got to reevaluate that and reevaluate those persons. And so without further ado, I want to be able to start our reading. And we're only just going to read the few verses that are in chapter one, but they were so powerful. They were so powerful to me that it had me to, 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 I was reading some of my sources where it was saying that John had that word and that love and that true Christian living and that, and those, those, uh, uh, um, I won't say requirements, but those recommendations, those suggestions that the writer made, it made it so clear and so plain that even an unbeliever was also led to believe in their unbelief that look how these Christians love one another. And this is what made them want to be a Christian, want them to get to know who this Jesus is, wanted them to understand that when I sin, when I go wrong, uh, uh, I need to be thinking, you all remember that, that, that phrase years ago, it may have faded out, but it still hold true today, true today, WWJD, what would Jesus do? When you're put in certain circumstances or situations, if you think about what would Jesus do in that situation, it'll have you doing the right thing because you know, if it was something ungodly, it was something that Jesus would not partake in. So then that meant we shouldn't partake in it. If it meant seeing a need in someone and meeting it, what would Jesus do? And this is what came out of the word for me in short. John says we should, we are or should be known by our love, point blank. So with saying that and keeping that in mind and keeping this in mind for 2020 today, I believe it's October 14, 2020. We're going to start reading because our lesson is going to take us deeper into Jesus being the light of love, life, and anything else good that comes with it. So if you would go with me to the book of 1 John, and you know, I love reading from, I love reading from the contemporary English version, but I also was reading through our life application as well as some of our King James. But if we start in chapter one of the book of 1 John, and before we get right to that, I want to mention a couple other things about John's blueprint and about the, the reasons and the purpose of him writing this book. The purpose of 1 John, well, I really went back to the book of John, which is 
one of these synoptic gospels early on in the New Testament, but its purpose, but its purpose in 1 John is to reassure Christians in their faith and to counter false teaching. The Apostle John was given authorship for this book, and this was, some people call it a letter, but it was more so of a sermon, more so of a message for the people during John's day. This letter is untitled and was written to no particular church. It was sent as a pastoral letter to several Gentile congregations, Gentile meaning non-Jewish. It also was written to all believers everywhere. It, John also, as I stated earlier, was an older man and perhaps only so, the only surviving apostle during his time. He had not yet been banished to the island of Patmos where he would live in exile. As an eyewitness of Christ, he wrote authoritatively to give this new generation of believers assurance and confidence in God and their faith. It also talked about some of the key features that's in this book of First John, which is John is the apostle of love and love is mentioned throughout his letter. There are a number of similarities between the letter of John and John's gospel early on in the New Testament in vocabulary, style and ideas. And we're going to see where John is going to use contrast of light and darkness, love and hate, life and death, God and Satan. We also are going to see in his blueprint, he's going to, to we're going to see some of the themes that are going to come out of this book, which are the theme talking about sin, because we cannot deny sin and our, sin is part of our nature. We can't deny it. And this is what some of the others were teaching that that uh, sin wasn't part of our nature. And once we became saved, we don't have to worry about not sinning anymore because we know all too well through being a witness that sin is going to be manifested in our lives no matter how close we walk to God. It's still going to be there. It's all in what you do with that sin. We're also going to talk about love as the theme, the central theme of this letter. The central theme of the Bible is love. It means that love means putting others first and being unselfish. It also it says love is an action, showing others we care, not just saying it, but showing them that we care, remember, by our deeds and our works. It also says to show love, we must give sacrificially and of, of our time and money to meet the needs of others. We're going to be talking about, again, being a part of God's family. Because how we treat others shows our shows who our father is. And remember, when you sin or when you hurt or harm or degrade or talk down to your brothers and sisters, uh, 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 that you're doing it to God, not to them, but this is how you're treating God. It's also going to talk about truth and error, truth against lies, because God is truth and light. So the more we get to know him, the better we can keep focus on the truth. It also says, don't be led astray by any teaching that denies Christ's deity, his divinity, or, hum or, human or, or being a human. Christ was both human and divine. And it also says, there are some things that we can test of the spirit to make sure it is of the spirit. And the assurance is the last, one of the last things that it mentions in our lesson, that assurance of our relationship with God is a promise. Uh, is a promise, but it also is a way of life. We build our confidence by trusting in God's word and in God's provisions for our sins. So here we go. I just had to bring out those other few points about Peter. I'm sorry, about first John, the apostle John and why he wrote this book. So if you would go with me to the first chapter in the book of first John, the word that gives life, verse one, the word, and that word w, it has a W, capitalized W, the word that gives life was from the beginning. And this is one our message is about. So he's going back to the beginning, to the word, when the word was God. And if you go back to Genesis and read that, but we're going to stay, we're going to stay here now and, 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 and continue to read that our ears have heard, our eyes have seen, and our hands have touched the word. John was saying this from experience. He saw Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He touched Jesus. So he's saying here, our ears have heard. Jesus taught John. He heard him. 
his eyes saw John. Nothing nobody had to tell him. But then he says, our, our hands have touched the word. So he touched Jesus. He touched the word. Verse number two, the one who gives life appeared. We saw it happen and we were witnesses to what we have seen. Mm. Lord have mercy. Now we are telling you about this eternal life that was with the father and appeared to us. So he's letting us know, mm, we've been talking about this eternal life. He saw the, he saw the eternal life manifest through Jesus, through God, through the word. Verse three, we are telling you what we have seen and heard so you may share in this life with us. He wants us to share in the same love and light and life that he found in Christ Jesus and that Christ gave to him and he's now an old person. We are now older people. I ain't calling nobody old. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about and I'm glad we're seeing these birthdays, amen? Because we're now able to be those states people, those elders to our younger generation. It also tells us, and we share it, and we share it with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. He's saying Christ is Jesus. I'm sorry, Christ is God. No matter how you look at it. Verse 4, we are writing to tell you these things because this makes us truly happy. Jesus told us God is light and doesn't have any darkness in him. Now we are telling you. So he's passing on the, the, the words of wisdom that Jesus gave to him as a disciple who now uh, John is an apostle. He is a mature, a matured disciple. And he's able to tell us what Jesus told him firsthand. It was nothing that nobody told him. Amen. It also tells us <clears throat> In verse number six, if we say we share in life with God and keep on living in the dark, we are lying or not living by the truth. Woo, glory. I'm going to read that one more time so the people in the back can hear me. Amen. If we say we share in the life with God and keep on living in the dark, we are lying and not living by the truth. Verse seven, but if we live in the light as God does, we share in life with each other. So this is why John is, is, is using those imageries of love, light, and life to describe the image of Jesus. Because he's actually describing the life that Jesus taught to the other disciples about God. He also says here, and the blood of his son, Jesus, washes all our sins away. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 8, if we say, we have not sinned. We are fooling ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's not in our hearts. Woo! That's where that come from. It tells us again, if we say we have not sinned, we are fooling ourselves and the truth isn't in us at all. It's not even in our hearts. Verse nine, but if we confess our sins to God, he can always be trusted to forgive us and take our sins away. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his message isn't in our hearts. And as we read those first 10 verses, hmm, that's pretty much the entire book of first John, because he's trying to help us. He's trying to help us to, 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 to understand and to know that Jesus is God. Jesus, that he walked with, that John walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, touched Jesus, talked by Jesus. What better witness there is to be able to get this word from, from 1 John in this lesson today? So, Lord, I was just still going over time after time some of the just remembering who John is, what John meant during his day how he confronted those false teachers and false preachers and, 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 and people and trying to help us to understand going over those sinful tendencies that we have, that by nature we are going to sin, but through Christ, he can wash away our sins. It doesn't mean that we're going to stop sinning because as long as we live, we, by us having a sinful nature, we're going to always sin. But what reason should we stop trying to move forward to still grow and to learn because when we grow, we learn and that helps us with our 
uh, in recognizing our sin. Mm, don't know if this is making any sense to anybody today, but John, I think, did a wonderful job because as we read uh, over the next week, if it's Lord's will, as we read over these next few weeks about the book of First John and Second John and I believe Third John, even as we get up to Revelation, John is helping us, helping us to, to and, 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 and reminding us, watch out those warnings. Watch out for the false teachers. Watch out for the false preachers. Because if they're telling you anything outside of this word here, they're lying. They're lying on God. They are leading people astray. And that's what happens if we tell untruths about God. Telling people, oh, God going to strike you down for lying. And we know that God hadn't struck us down. So we need to remember that God is a forgiving God and he gives, he's keeping us here as Peter reminded us on last week. God is keeping us here long enough for us to continue to try to get it right and to walk closer and closer with Jesus. And so if he still allowed us to be here every day, every day is a day to get, get it right and to stay close to God. And so John was able to talk to the people as we were reading, I was looking over verses 9 and 10, 8 through 10 again. And it says, if we say if we, say we have not sinned, we are fooling ourselves and the truth ain't in us. Tell the truth and shame the devil. You got to remember that. It says here, but if we confess our sins, and don't you know confession is good for the soul? Anybody ever thought about it or even recognized it in your life, even though... You remember we talked about how if we profess our sins or confess our sins to God or to each other, and you don't have to tell everybody your business, I'm not talking about that because we don't know any owe any man an explanation. But if we confess, that's freedom. It gives us a way to get that, to lift those heavy burdens off of our chest. Because, you know, sometimes we get too proud and we don't want to, we want people to think we have it all together. That we don't have any faults or we don't have any problems. But you know, sometimes we focus on other folks' problems and remind them of their shortcomings so it keep us from looking at our own. But John here today is helping us to understand even when we profess. Because like when we say, we've said before, when God knows our heart, God really knows our heart. So we need to stop fooling ourselves and thinking that we're fooling God like we're fooling other people. Amen? About the motives that are going on in our heart. And so it says, verse nine, but if we confess our sins to God, he can always, he can always be trusted to forgive us and take our sins away. And, and, and so confession for me is good for the soul. How many have ever confessed something that made them feel so much better? Lord have mercy. Didn't it give you a freedom, a sense of relief? Not to have to carry this burden by yourself or to keep carrying this lie around or this hurt around. And some people may not like to hear your confession or say if you, it's, it's kind of like when you apologize to people. It's more than just saying I apologize. And, and I re, I, I, I've learned to stop saying I'm sorry because we're not sorry. <laughs> I don't mean sorry as in not intending to do what we did. But we're not sorry in being a human and being Christ-like and being and confessing Christ as our Savior. So when you apologize to people, don't just say, oh, I apologize if I, I hurt your feelings or if I said something inappropriate. Don't say, don't, if, if, if you say it another way, I apologize for and say what you did. Admit what you did. Because this way, whew, you're actually apologizing. Because anybody can say, oh, I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. But what are you sorry for? We know that God knows, but the person needs to know as well. And believe me, I don't know about any of you, but I have felt so much better whew, when I confessed. I guess that's maybe why the Catholics still have confession. <laughs> but we can, but they confess to their, their, the hierarchy of the priest. But we go directly through Jesus to God. We can talk to God ourselves. So we don't have to confess anything to man to be judged, to be given uh, a fee to pay and, and, and a few Hail Marys. And I'm not no way dissing or talking about those people that are under the Catholic 
church. I'm not talking about anybody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. But we can go directly to God because we have accepted Jesus as our personal savior. And so as we continue to look at those 10 verses, it was helping me to understand too that we still, that if we have fellowship with God and still walk in darkness, we can't love God and still court our sins at the same time. Remember something we did in our lesson before talking about we can't be straddling the fence. We can't say we love God who we've never seen and look at our brothers and sisters every day and do not have a relationship with them and don't even speak to them half of the time. So it's telling us that we can't live in sin and still walk in darkness and, and, and fellowship with God at the same time. You can, but if you are not changing, if you don't repent, if you don't grow, then you'll st still be right back where you started. Because it was helping me to understand that people had known that, uh, that John understood that the people had no natural tendency towards sin. That they were without sin. They thought they were without sin and that they were incapable of sinning. See, the false preachers and the false prophets made them think that they were incapable of sin, sinning since they confessed Jesus as their personal savior. But how many of us know that that ain't true? How many of us still sinning today? And that should be everybody. And I'm going to raise my, both my hands. Amen. If I could, I'm going to count my hands, my fingers and toes and everything else. But we have to understand the false teachers refuse to take sin seriously. And this is what this, this lesson is all about. They refuse to believe or to take sin seriously. They told people that, oh, you can go ahead and fulfill your, your, your lustly desires. You can either go through a, uh, you know, that's why they used to wear the chastity belts and all this stuff back in the day to try to hold back their sexual uh, desires. So you either going to go through some sort of rigorous uh, uh, um, discipline or you're just going to forget about it and say, oh, I'm just going to go and I'm going to die anyway. I'm going to do what I want to do. But that's not what it's all about. He wanted, John wanted people to be, wanted, they wanted to be considered Christians, but they didn't want to confess and repent and what repent means to change. They wanted to remain the same. And how many know you can't remain the same after you encounter the living Savior? Your life is going to change some shape, form, or fashion. We are no longer the same once we walk with the Lord. So it was letting us know that they were the Christians that John was writing to, they wanted to be considered Christians. I'm going to say that one more time. But they didn't want to confess or they didn't want to repent or to change. Matter of fact, the false teachers were encouraging sin. So if anybody is encouraging you to sin, I think you might need to relook at that relationship because they were in denial. They were in denial and so are a lot of us today are in denial. They denied that their conduct involved any sin at all. They didn't think they were even sinning. Jesus. And the reason we can know that they were false teachers is because they lied and they ignored the basic truths about Christ. So if you know, that's why I want us to hold on to those basics that I talked about early on in the, in, in the lesson. Hold on to the basics that you know about Jesus, that you know about God, that you know about the doctrine of Jesus Christ. You hold on to that. You remember that and you use that because you'll know when somebody is lying and you'll know that they are not living the basics that we first learned about Jesus. So you remember those basics. Remember those basics that we talked about? The basics of basic training and why you go through basic training before you go to combat, before you, uh, why, when you join the military. Why do you think a teacher goes through rigorous, a doctor goes through rigorous medical schools and studies and to learn how to be a doctor? They just don't wake up and be a doctor one day. They have to go through training. They have to go through internship, through residences in order to be uh, uh, a doctor um, in the end. And so it also talked about how you have, just think about, and maybe we, our, our police, law enforcement need to go back to this, but they need to go back to the police academy or they need to teach a little bit more sensitivity training and other things about human life in these um, um, law enforcement police, and ca police academy before people are given a gun and a badge to go and protect and to serve. So these are just other examples of basic training that people must have. Think about a teacher. 
Someone who's teaching your, your, your grandchildren, that taught you, that taught your, 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 your family, your people. They had to go to school to understand, whew, to, 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 to get the basics of teaching to be able to teach. And I'm still learning because when I walked into this new inspiration class, whoo, I forget how many years ago now, but I was nowhere where I am now in terms of my learning and my growth because I grow each week that I come before you. The word applies to me too. I, it's convicting to me as I'm studying. It convicts me. So when I have to bring it to you, whoo, I've already gone through my basic training. Amen. And as I'm teaching it still, it still rises up some convictions in me as well. Because I can't teach you something that I'm not doing myself or I can't help you to understand something that I'm not truly understanding myself. And so, going back to that, the false teachers were encouraging sin. That's what they were doing. And they also said that uh, uh, by nature, we have to remember, though, the basics that we learned when we came to Christ and gave Christ our hearts and, 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 whew, and to walk with Christ and make him our personal savior. We know that all people are sinners by nature and by practice. It is difficult for many folks to admit their faults and shortcomings, even to God. So if you can't talk to God about Lord. Help me to stop being this person that I am that is not of your will, that you did not create me to be. Don't let people use you as garbage cans to dump gossip and trash and, 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 and wrongness and evilness into your spirit. So as we go to God and we come before God, so since we know that by nature we are already sinful whoo, and we have shortcomings, we can talk to God. And I know God will make it all right. And I'm telling you that as a witness. I don't have to confess to you or my other brothers or my sisters, but I can go directly to God and he will not judge me. So that's something that we have to remember that true confessions leads to freedom. Freedom to enjoy fellowship with Christ and our loved ones and other Christians and other believers. That it should ease our conscience and our cares. Don't you know, like we said earlier, when you confess your sins, when you openly admit it, you know, sometimes we keep things inside because we don't want people to know how we really feel. And some things kind of should be kept, but some things should be shared. And so you don't have to tell a person your business, but you can also, but you can tell it to God and you know, God won't tell nobody. Amen. But you have to understand God knows, but once you openly confess something, that's opening the door right there. That's opening that door right there for us to be able to clear our conscience, get that heaviness, get that guilt. You know, we self-persecute ourselves. We got to stop self-persecution. God has given, has forgiven us, but we still hold on to it and we keep beating ourselves up about what we did back when we were teenagers. And we all, I ain't going to say everybody, but I know I was, I was, I was kind of out there as a teenager, amen? My early 20s before I started learning any better, amen? But we all have done things that we're not proud of is my point. And we still do things that we're not proud of. But how many know when we go to God and confess, Lord, please forgive me for my sins. Please forgive me for those sins that I know that I committed and those that I don't know that I committed. Lord, just please help me. It says because most folks didn't understand then that's what John really believed that a lot of people didn't understand the freedom that confession, true confession would give them. And some of us still don't understand that today. Amen. And so as we prepare to close out our lesson today, we have to remember that John is going to be talking about Jesus as God. And they are the light that help us to conquer. And I'm talking L-I-G-H-T. It also helps us to know that uh, we can even have the same impact on unbelievers that some of the early Christians and early church had on unbelievers during their day. Unbelievers can be impressed by how we handle things, how Christians use Jesus as that alternative instead of sinning. We, there's that question that I asked earlier in the lesson. What would Jesus do? WWJD, how can we live our life? How can we live to show people? How can we live to show God? 
How can we live to show ourselves that we possess all the goodness that God created us to be? Even though we're going to sin, that should not stop us from growing. But we got to change now. We can't remain the same. We got to confess to God, confess to ourselves where we fall short and ask God to help us. And so as we prepare to close out and, and if it's the Lord's will to come back next week to talk about all these wonderful, wonderful imageries and wonderful words that John used to describe Jesus as being the light, the love and the life. And this is a life that we would love to live free of guilt and sin and pain because we know that Jesus sacrificed. He was our sacrifice. He was our sacrificial lamb. His blood is what made us whole. So we don't have to remember. We don't need no dead animals. We don't have to go and sacrifice any dead animals for our relationship with God to be made whole. If we take John's advice, <clears throat> if we think about the sin and the evil that the devil brings and replace it with the good and the light, it'll drive out darkness because darkness cannot live in light. And if Jesus is light, whoo, okay, I'm going to stop before I kind of get into a little preaching because I wanted to do more teaching today. But, but, but I just wanted us to be able to understand where we are some things that John shared, the Apostle John. See, remember when he wrote the book of John, he was merely a disciple, which is, wasn't light now. That wasn't a light duty right there. But now John is old. John is elder. Think about us. Remember when we were young and now we're old. Think about that, where we are. Where we are. And I just want to thank you all for allowing the writers of the word to help us to grow. And we see why the book of Hebrews and Paul was trying to get us off the milk. Paul birthed us. Remember the metaphors that were used? Paul was the doctor. He was the obstetrician, the OBGYN doctor. Then James came on board and helped to grow us. He was the practical nurse. And we saw where, 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 where James and Peter, they're continuing to help us grow. And now we're at Apostle John. He is an elder. And remember, we must listen to our elders. This is what we teach our people, our young people. So remembering that light conquers. Light conquers. Love conquers. And we can live a life fulfilled. Even with what's going on around us today, we can still live a fulfilled life. If you keep your eyes on Jesus and not on the news and not on the corona and not on that, I want you to keep in mind and know where it's at and, 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 and what's going on around you, but you don't let it dictate how you're going to live or how you're going to love or how you're going to live your life. Or are you going to be a light in somebody else's life? Remember we talked about it's, you can still shine your flashlight when you're going through it to help somebody else through their dark times. So be that, that inner light that from Christ is in us can come out of us to shine outwardly and we don't need no spotlight over our head to show who we are because that light is, in, is within. Christ comes from within. Christ is in our heart. Oh, Jesus. We don't need no outside light. You use your light for someone in this dark world. And so I just want to thank you all for Allowing me, I didn't know how this lesson was going to manifest today, but I had to try to give us some imageries. I had to try to use some metaphors myself to be able to help us to remember what Christ is in our lives and who Christ is. And this is what John did in the book of John, and he's doing it now as the Apostle John. He's giving us an opportunity to still get to know Jesus. That's why we're still around here today. That's why God keep waking us up every day. So that we can, uh, he didn't give us any new commandments. G, uh, J, uh, uh, John didn't give us any new commandments. He just helped us. He just helped us to remember the basics of the commandments that Jesus and the promises that God had already to given, uh, to given to us. He was helping us to remember to come out of the darkness and stay in the light with Jesus. To walk with Jesus, to walk in the light, that beautiful light. 
Remember, Jesus is the light of the world. It also talked to us, and Paul is, I'm sorry, and, 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 and John is helping us to remember we don't need to be in the world. We don't need to do and have the things, the desires that the world wants because when we have Jesus, when we, when we make Jesus the Lord of our lives, he's going to give us the desires of our hearts anyway. We're going to be like Solomon. When God asked Solomon, what did he want? Solomon could have asked for anything. Remember, Solomon asked for wisdom because he was smart enough to know if he had the wisdom, he's going to get the money and everything else that comes with it. Amen? And so let's be those that type of people, let's be that people, those people that, that the world can look at and know that we're different, that we're different from the world. They want to know how we can still love, how black people as a whole, our culture can still love people and they killing us and, and doing things to us. Whew. How we can still love and forgive. Isn't that what Jesus did? What would Jesus do? Mm. So we might need to bring that back up in, in, into play. You know, we wore all the wristbands and the, the Bible covers and all this stuff. WWJD. Let's don't forget it. It just wasn't a passing fad or a passing fashion or something just to do at that time. And then a lot of people tried to contradict that by saying, uh, we can't do what Jesus did. He performed miracles and signs and wonders and all of those type of things. But our spiritual gifts allow us to be more and more like Jesus and to answer that question, what would Jesus do? We have to remember, God gives each one of us spiritual gifts and talents to use. So that's how we can use that phrase, what would Jesus do? We can use that not because we would not, be, but it's because we love Jesus. We belong to Jesus. We want, we made him our personal savior so that we have all the access to God that we need. Oh, Lord have mercy. So I'm down now to the last about five minutes. So I'm going to get ready to hush up, but I just want to thank everybody. I just want to thank you all for joining today and, and for sharing and just keeping in mind that John says we are or should be known for our love or by our love. So if people can't see love or our actions, our actions should show our love for other people, especially those that are in need, those that are invisible to society, invisible to the government. Use what we have to help people who in their time of need, seeing a need and meeting him. So with saying all that, bow your heads with me, Father God. We come before you today again with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. Father, we thank you for loving us, for giving your son to this world where some rejected him, but others received him. Thank you, Lord, for being the light, the love in our life. And being our life, for without you, we are nothing, can be nothing, or can do nothing. And Lord, we want to tell you thank you. Father, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. We ask that you create in us clean hearts and renew a right spirit within us. And Father, we ask that those that do not know that you are in pardon of their sins, help us. Help us to be your witness to them, like John, like Peter, like those witnesses, like Paul, those that witness to people, even while we're struggling and going through to help them to see that you are forgiving God, that you love them, despite, even if they don't feel no one else loves them, for them to know that you do. Father, I want to thank you for this noon Bible study class, Lord. I want to thank you for those that join us, however they are receiving this this lesson, Lord, I want to thank them for joining us today and coming back week after week after week. Then we're going to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And we're going to ask, Lord, that you continue to keep us and guide us until we come back together again and touch those who are bereaved right now, Father. Touch those whose hearts are heavy, Lord. And help us to, be, to confess what we need to confess to give us the freedom and for us to, to cast our cares upon you. Father, because we know that you are the only one, Lord, that can receive it and, and to keep us. So, Father, we want to thank you again. We want to thank you for our class, our pastor, our first lady, our churches, our all around the world, but especially our church and pastor, Dr. R.L. White and first lady, 
Lorraine White, Lord, we want to thank you. Father, all we fail in granting, please, all in asking, please do not fail in granting. And we ask all these blessings in your precious son, Jesus' name. And let every heart say amen. Amen. And amen. Come on, open up your microphones. We're going to give God some love. Open up your microphones. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We lift you. Woo, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Put your arms around yourself. Hug yourself. I love you and ain't nothing you can do about it. God bless you. May God keep you. Stay safe. Wear your mask. Get out and vote. The polls are open. Wear your mask. Take your chair. Pack your patience. Go and vote. No matter what they try to do to stop us, we're going to vote. We're going to make some changes because a change is going to come. Amen? So don't forget, you got amendments on the ballot. You have candidates on the ballot. Choose. All right. I see you're voting. Okay, Miss Cherry. I'm going to get out tomorrow if it's the Lord's will. I wanted to give them a few days to get all the kinks out. Amen? So, but remember to get out and vote because that's how we are assured of a democracy that's going to look out for all the people. So I'm going to stop. It's one o'clock. I love you. Thank you. And remember, and, and just remember, and happy birthday to everybody who's celebrating birthdays in the month of October. We just love you, and ain't nothing you can do about it. Bye-bye. 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 Hey, everybody. It's good to see everybody. There you go, Betty. I see you, Betty. Ah. Hey. Hey, Colette. Hey, Herman. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you so much. Hey, Mother Pauline and Miss Veronica. Hey, Grace and Edie. Hey, Mimi. Thank y'all for tuning in. Um, Brother Massey, Brother Gates, Miss Joyce. Hey, Auntie. Hey, Calvin and Earlene. Hey, Miss Rose. Hey, Linda. Good to see you today. Hey, Harvey and Peggy, my favorite couple. I love you all. Hey, Miss Terry. I love you all. And if it's the Lord's will, I'll see y'all next week. Amen. God bless. God bless. Go vote. Get out and go vote. Go vote. Amen. 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 Hey, Colette. Did I say hey, Colette? Hey there. You're looking pretty. Thank you all. I'm so proud of Betty. I'm so proud of Betty. I don't know what to do right now. Glory. We got a visual. <laughs> Amen. 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 Brother Massey, you doing all right over there? Good to see you today. Vivian, thank you so much for all that you do for the class. We thank you so much. Bye-bye. I love you all. Hey. I love you all. I get so excited when we come on this Zoom. I don't know what to do. I just be so excited. <laughs> Thank you, God. Woo! Lord have mercy. Next week, chapter 2, 1 John. 1 John, chapter 2, if it's the Lord's will. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Slow down. Slow down. Hey, Erlene. Hey, Erlene. Amen. God bless everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all for joining us. Miss Marilyn, Miss Maddie, Sister Carrie, uh, Odette, Chauncey, Loretta, Krista. Thank you all so much. Cynthia, my family in South Carolina, thank you so much. And I miss Stephanie today, but I know she's going to catch us later. I love you. God bless. Bye-bye.